Okay. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, good, good afternoon. Uh, esteemed uh, colleagues of the panel, ladies and gentlemen, uh, let me first and foremost uh, thank you all for joining online this consultation, which is held in this difficult and unprecedented situation the world is currently uh, having. On behalf of the panel, I wish you, your families and your friends and colleagues continued health and safety. I would also wish to thank the Secretariat for organizing this event very professionally despite these challenging circumstances. This panel officially launched on 2nd March 2020 is a joint initiative launched by the presidents of the General Assembly and the Economic and Social Council with a view to enhancing the fight against illicit financial flows and to mobilizing financing for the Sustainable Development Goals by 2030. Raising sufficient and partly domestic resources for the implementation of the 2030 Agenda is, as you all know, a major challenge. And there is no doubt that this challenge will be exacerbated by the current economic downturn and financial turmoil due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, we are convinced that the only way forward is to remain committed to a revitalized global partnership for sustainable development that is based on a spirit of global solidarity between governments, private sector and civil society in support of the implementation of the SDGs. This is why we need to ramp up our collective effort to enhance financial accountability, transparency and integrity, which is key for building solid global partnership to advance our shared goals. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the panel's second virtual consultation. We met with member states on 24 April, and we will be meeting with experts and think tanks in the coming days. The panel will continue with an open and transparent approach to its work. And for the panel to make actionable recommendations, we need to engage regularly with all stakeholders. Let me now update you on highlights of the panel's work since the launch. Despite restrictions on international travel and meetings, the panel has already begun its substantive work. On 31st March, the full panel held its first video conference with all members attending. The panel has reviewed the background paper prepared by the Secretariat, which is available on the panel's website. The paper provides an overview of existing international frameworks related to financial integrity, analysis of cross-cutting issues, and recommendations of topics for possible future consideration by the panel. The panel agreed to split up further work into three clusters. A cluster one is about improving cooperation in tax matters. Cluster two is about accountability, public reporting and anti-corruption measures. And cluster three, is on cooperation and settling disputes. The cluster leads were also agreed. Because of the unavoidable delays in the panel's work due to COVID-19, 
the panel is likely to complete its full interim report only in September. As far as in-person meetings are concerned, we are following the guidance of the WHO and the UN system on travel and meeting organization. But we remain hopeful that should happen as soon as circumstances would allow. Ladies and gentlemen, the civil society has been very vocal and active on the issue of illicit financial flows. The panel wants to hear what are your views? What are, what do you see as priority actions for promoting financial accountability, transparency and integrity for financing the 2030 agenda? All your inputs will feed into the interim report of a panel and I Sincerely thank you in advance for your contributions. Please note that the meeting will be recorded and posted online in the next few days. And at this time, I should normally uh, pass the floor to Her Excellency Dalia Riboskaite, who is the co-chair of the panel, uh, so that we pursue uh, our interaction with uh, the global civil society. But uh, as uh, Peter, uh, as the secretariat is indicating to us, uh, apparently she is not online. Am I right? Oh, that's correct. She's having trouble connecting. So we should. Okay. We are also having trouble with our first speaker. So we should move to the second speaker on the list and come back. Okay. So before we proceed with uh, our rounds of interventions. Let, let me ask you to mute your microphones to avoid background noise and to keep the interventions clear. And uh, please do keep your interventions brief, no more than five minutes, so that the panel has enough time to respond to your remarks. So uh, I would like to now ask Mr. Daniel Erickson, the Managing Director of Transparency International, uh, to intervene. So, Mr. Erickson, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Miyaki. Uh, it is a pleasure to join you today to share with you Transparency International's position on this important initiative. We welcome it as an effort to enhance accountability, transparency and integrity in global finance. There is a pressing need for bold political action to bridge the estimated annual SDG funding gap of 2.5 trillion US dollars. We need innovative approaches to mobilize and safeguard resources for sustainable development. We are grateful for the panel's proactive engagement with civil society. We hope that this approach continues during the next stages of the panel's work and so civil, civil society organizations are given the opportunity to provide written contributions. Today, I would like to share with you the three proposals to clamp down on illicit financial flows and transnational corruption. Two of the proposals relate to stemming illicit financial flows with a focus on the problem of secrecy, and one of them relates to recovering the assets that have been illicitly taken. So number one, we need a common agenda on secrecy. Existing international frameworks provide a wide range of measures to tackle different issues relating to initial illicit financial flows, such as corruption, tax evasion, tax avoidance, and other criminal activities. All of these issues thrive on the same thing, secrecy. For that reason, Transparency International proposes a common core agenda for tackling illicit flows that focuses on secrecy. This common core agenda would aim to bring together the dispersed frameworks and policy areas around the core issues of secrecy. One way to operationalize this would be to encourage all relevant actors to prioritize the issue of secrecy by taking concrete measures to address it in their respective fields or 
predefined period of time. In practice, this could mean reforming reporting standards, placing more emphasis on transparency in concrete review assessments, as well as making opacity the focus of policy and research output. By enhancing transparency and removing anonymity, particularly around uh, company ownership, we stand a better chance of uh, arresting the illicit flow of resources out of the countries of origin. It will help prevent corruption actors from siphoning off development finance into private accounts stashed away in secrecy jurisdictions and help to detect it when they do. We believe that this panel can play an important role in advancing the debate around secrecy and anonymity in a way that contributes to the achievement of the goals of existing bodies and frameworks and fills a gap in the international infrastructure, as there is currently no body with a mandate and reach to explore innovative solutions to this problem. Issue number two, a global asset registry, consisting of database that of asset companies, properties, valuable goods, crypto assets, and their real owners. Not only would this enable the concentration of capital to be calculated, it is an essential step to allow countries to introduce wealth taxes, a measure now being widely considered as a potential source of revenue to address the economic fallout of the COVID-19 pandemic. A global asset registry would also contribute to the fight against corruption, tax evasions, and other sources of illicit financial flows. Hiding and laundering illicit or unreported funds would become much more difficult if tax authorities and law enforcement had the ability to access this data. Naturally, the registry would also facilitate international cooperation and asset recovery. The good news is that we will not be starting from scratch. The beneficial ownership transparency agenda has made great strides in recent years. At least 40 countries have already uh, required companies to disclose their real owners to a register. The common reporting standard re uh, requiring financial institutions to automatically share financial account information with tax authorities is another important step. The CRS should be expanded to cover other types of assets like real estate. The FACTI panel should explore how existing initiatives could contribute to a global assets registry and consider the necessary infrastructure to establish such a registry. In addition, uh, to measures aimed at stemming the, the flow of initial uh, funds, the panel should also consider enforcement measures and remedies, which leads me up to the third issue, asset recovery. In 2011, the Stolen Asset uh, Recovery Assistance estimated that developing countries lose 20 to 40 billion each year to bribery, embezzlement and other corrupt practices. That could be 400 billion over the last 10 years alone. This would probably be a low estimate as it's uh, the, the direct cause of corruption does not factor in the harm done by those corrupt practices. Only a small fraction of the missing funds have been returned, meaning the rest is lost for financing towards sustainable development. Since the UNCAC was introduced, there has been some progress in asset recovery, but far from what we hoped for. The promise of the asset recovery chapter has not been realized for a variety of reasons, including those uh, that were elaborated in the STARS 2011 Barriers Report. To address, we propose a major international initi initiative for the return of proceeds of corruption to countries of origin, including in foreign bribery cases where, where the harm to victims should be repaired. The initiative could potentially also cover the recovery of assets lost due to tax evasion. We suggest that this panel explore the possibility of a multilateral agreement, perhaps a protocol to the UNCAC on the following four issues. One, ways to accelerate the asset recovery process. Two, standards and procedures for ensuring rep uh, reparations to state and non-state victims in foreign bribery cases. Three, standards for accountable assets returned. And four, recognizing the role of NGO stakeholders in asset recovery processes. So in conclusion, I'm trying to keep myself short. Five minutes was a bit quicker than I had originally uh, planned for. With only 10 years left, 
to achieve the 2030 targets, there is a need for seismic change. We are living in a time of seismic change, and we need it in, in order to ensure that the resources intended to build schools, hospitals, health facilities, and other key development infrastructure are not captured by special interests. Existing institutions must play their part in shining a light on secrecy by establishing global asset registry and accelerating the return of misappropriated assets. Only in this way can we safeguard the vast resources needed to overcome the immediate COVID-19 crisis and the subsequent recession. The panel has a key role to play in driving forward this ambitious agenda. Transparency International, with our network of more than 100 chapters in more than 100 countries, stands ready to support measures to disrupt the mechanisms and networks that enable corruption, tax evasion, and tax avoidance. Thank you very much. I hope I kept to my five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Erickson, and we have taken duly note of uh, the three proposals. Uh, so now I'd like to turn to Mr. Alvin Mosioma, the Executive Director of Tax Justice Network Africa. Uh, please, Mr. Mosioma, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency and uh, fellow panelists for, for this opportunity and I hope that um, I'll be able to keep my submissions within the time uh, provided we were indicated that we'll have a little bit more time than that, but I'll try to be as, as brief uh, as, as, as possible. First, um, I'll start first by ta thanking the, the, the panel for, for this invitation. I speak both on behalf of the Tax Justice Network Africa but also uh, representing a consortium of um, five, six Pan-African organizations organized under the Stop the Bleeding campaign, which was launched in 2015 um, at, the, at the launch of the high-level panel report, um, the Africa high-level panel report. I think that to start, it's really important to locate the, the conversation within the current ongoing crisis, and I'm very happy that the chair noted that this crisis is going to have particularly for developing countries are uh, very um, uh, disastrous impact. Projections indicate that the, the post-COVID crisis is gonna present huge challenge that might lead to economic collapse for, for many countries, causing not just economic, but social, uh, social um, uprising. It's really also important to recognize and situate the work of the panel as contributing to mitigating the adverse impact of the post-COVID crisis and ensure that uh, we are not going back to business, as, to business as usual. And in this regard, I think the role of tackling and stemming illicit financial flows and supporting domestic resource mobilization will become a key pillar and a key plank in helping uh, particularly developing countries to mobilize the resources they need to be able to reconstruct um, uh, the economies um, as a result of the, the expected uh, implications from the, from the from the current uh, from the current crisis. Secondly, chair, um, I think locating the work of the factory panel within um, the ongoing uh, global reforms on on the international financial system, it's important to underscore that there has been um, discontent and concern, particularly. Um, from a number of, of, of actors in the South, governments and civil society, in terms of both the process and the issues that are being highlighted for reform under the leadership of the OECD-led uh, process or the BEPS, the so-called BEPS process. We are concerned that uh, the main issues that uh, we as civil society organizations and actors have tried to put on the table have not received their, their due attention and we are hoping that this panel will be able to recognize that, to recognize this aspect and locate the concerns of developing countries uh, in the center of the outcome, outcome report. Thirdly, Chair, um, it's also important to, to note that um, the ongoing reforms need to meet the threshold and the best practice that have been already established in similar consultations in other regions, and specifically worth mentioning is the uh, great work that has been done 
uh, under the uh, in, in the African continent uh, through the uh, illicit financial flows uh, high level panel that was chaired by by the His Excellency Thabo Mbeki, which in terms both in terms of process and issues that were highlighted, I think sets a very good uh, bar in terms of what the expectations of this panel should be. Now, allow me Chair, uh, with, uh, to speak to three very specific issues, which I think that should form uh, an important aspect of the work of the panel. One, I think that there is an emerging dichotomy between tax transparency and the reforms of the global tax rules. One of these concerns is that the main focus we feel that um, should be is that the, the focus on the reforms of the of the global tax rules should form the heart of this conversation while we recognize the issues of transparency are important and would contribute to stemming illicit financial flows. We will not make as much progress as if we don't uh, at the center of the conversation bring in the issues of reforming the, the international uh, the global rules of, 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 uh, of, of the, the international global rules and the fear we have chair is that the the work of the panel will lead to uh, a dichotomy where the un processes will be focusing on on the transparency agenda while the oecd will continue to take leadership in terms of the global rules under the best process and this i think chair we should ensure that all steps are taken um, to ensure that the reforms of the international global rules are at the heart of the work of the panel. Second, the chair is to speak on the issues of, of the global governance. As you know, this has been one of the one of the major crust of, of, of the contestation. Um, and this has to do with who is on the table when it comes to the, the global rules. We see the OECD um, taking a, a central role uh, and leaving the, 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 the issues and the concerns of developing countries in the periphery. We feel that the effort that the calls that have been made, made both by, by, uh, the, by the G77 and um, the Africa group towards the establishment of an uh, intergovernmental body that will be charged with the responsibility of setting the agenda on the reforms of the international uh, tax rules. We note and with concern, Chair, that uh, the, the, the panel has uh, called for the Convention for Tax Transparency, and we are concerned that uh, this call does not meet uh, some of the, the demands that civil society have made of the establishment of a UN tax convention. And thirdly, Chair, uh, it's important also to ensure that we are locating um, the work of the fact panel within the within the UN uh, processes. I say this because if we follow uh, again, we borrow leaf from the high level panel work. We realize, of course, that the UN panel work was not just a report that came out, but it had the, the mandate and the support of the African states, which ultimately led to the declaration, a special declaration um, on, on, on IFF, which, which bound African countries to be able to, um, uh, which made a commitment by African countries to, to be able to um, implement the recommendations of, uh, of, of the work of the, of the panel, of the recommendations of, of, of the work of the high level panel on illicit financial flows. So we are hoping, Chair, that similar uh, steps will be undertaken to ensure that the report that comes out of this panel uh, receives the support of the UN uh, member states and also there is a very clear uh, roadmap that is set uh, and commitments made by, by member states to implement the recommendations of uh, the work of the panel. In conclusion, Chair, um, just to draw in three, three very last conclusions which I think are really important to, to underscore. Firstly, is that um, we should ensure that the, the work of the, 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 this panel is not uh, instrumentalized to pursue the agenda that reinforces the current skew of the global rules to the disadvantage of, 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 uh, of developing countries. And here we note this, particularly when we read the original concept one that has been circulated by the panel, we note that some of the issues that uh, have been at the heart of, of, of from, from developing countries are missing. And to give an example, 
is the mention of uh, the, the UN tax uh, uh, convention or the UN tax body as it, as it were. So it's really important that, that, the, that, that the, the panel in this consultation make sure that the concerns that developing countries have been raising both uh, the Africa group, but more importantly, the G77 also form part of, of the outcome of the outcome uh, of, of the outcome report from, from the panel. Second, Chair, we are concerned that uh, the process uh, the, uh, with the process and the politics of the civil society consultation and would want to, to ensure that this does not become a mere box ticking exercise. For the panel uh, concerning the, with issues of transparency and accountability, it is important to underscore that no room has been provided for a true uh, discussion uh, with, with the panel members. And I hope that going forward, there will be a, a process that is open and transparent uh, to ensure that we are bringing in uh, voices that even those that uh, that we, we, we disagree with. Lastly, uh, Chair, it is also to ensure that the final outcome of this report builds upon and it does not contradict similar initiatives and processes that have already been established, such as the African Union uh, Special Declaration on Illicit Financial Flows and the summary report of the UN uh, High Level Meeting on Illicit Financial Flows. I'll beg to close the chair and thanks for, for, for the time again. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Musioma. So I thank you. I thank both of you, uh, Mr. Erickson and Mr. Musioma, for your proposals and for raising your concerns. Um, so le let me now give a floor to our panel members who would like to uh, comment or uh, respond to some of the issues that were raised. Is there any panel member who would like to intervene at this moment? I think Irene is saying she'll speak. Okay. Okay, so Irene, please. Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and thank you as well to the society representatives. Uh, thank you very much to the civil society representatives for giving us very illuminating input, both with respect to the process the, 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 of the FACTI panel um, moving forward and also on substantive content. I think much of what has been said aligns with the three clusters that the FACTI panel has focused on, although they also do enrich and amplify. Uh, one thing I just would want to mention is that in the work of the panel, it was agreed by the panel that uh, issues to do with global governance and the politics of reform and the roles of different stakeholders, including civil society actors and other non-state actors, were seen as cross-cutting issues that will be looked at in all three clusters of work. So I think specific input that has been made can strengthen that work as we proceed. And I would call on our colleagues from civil society to send in written uh, more written comments that can support this work with the specific proposals as, has, as you have started and elaborated today. Uh, probably moving forward in our remaining program of work, we can look at how to improve on the consultations and input from outside of the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Irene. Um, any other comment? I just, uh, this is Susan, is that okay? Yes, please. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you. I thought um, these were both very helpful comments. Um, to the extent either of you has uh, more background information that we should be looking at, which we obviously need to investigate ourselves, but um, it seemed to me that both of you were raising things that we we have already to some extent thought about, but that need to do 
need to be a more look at it in more in depth. And um, I at least would welcome things that are there's a there's two things that are important: uh, formal reports and commissions and uh, that have been proposed and that we need to understand how they're actually working and research by civil society or uh, others that looks at how effective or ineffective um, existing uh, um, things are. Uh, and the, the more precise and uh, uh, specific those things could be, uh, the more helpful that would be to us uh, in, in understanding you know, where, the, where the gaps are and uh, where the, there's more possibility, there's possibility of actually making um, constructive uh, suggestions. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, before I move to a second round of interventions, I just wanted to highlight the fact that uh, uh, this panel is independent, so we don't uh, evidently intend to be instrumentalized. So uh, um, by, by definition, what governs us is a common objective of um, uh, trying to add value to the existing frameworks. And in that sense, uh, we will pursue our task in the most independent way. So instrumentalization is not in our game plan at all. Uh, so I, I, I think it's important to, to make it uh, uh, very clear. I, I hear your concerns. But uh, in the name of all the panel members, I would like to flag this issue uh, very uh, strongly. So uh, in our second round of intervention, uh, we have uh, Sargon Nissan, the Director of Financial Transparency Coalition. So please, Mr. Nissan, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Your Excellency, and all panelists for the opportunity to speak to you today. The uh, on behalf of the Financial Transparency Coalition, the uh, FTC is a coalition of uh, civil society working to curtail illicit financial flows through the promotion of a transparent, accountable, and sustainable financial system. My comments draw extensively from a letter we published prior to the FACTI panel's uh, recent consultation with member states last week, and it is available on our website at financialtransparency.org. I will begin with some general remarks. The pandemic's social and economic consequences are exacerbated by the deep inequalities between and within countries, of which illicit financial flows are a major driver. The FTC's focus is global. However, it is incontestable that poorer countries and those living in poverty within countries are paying the cost of the current financial transparency and tax architecture. Opacity over ownership and financial information, along with company structures that are designed to abuse tax rules and norms, leave the burden of mobilizing domestic resources to be borne by those least able to do so. Developing countries' insufficient representation in international institutions means this reality is neglected, such as when considering the G20 and the leadership mandate it provided to the OECD over corporate tax reform. The disproportionate loss of financial resources from the Global South is a direct result of an international regulatory architecture that systematically excludes and marginalizes developing countries in multilateral policymaking forums, as well as in the governance of key institutions. Fulfilling the panel's mandate, I believe, obligates you to consider these voice and governance issues alongside the technical ones. Those benefiting from secrecy are not just the corrupt, but also the private industries facilitating systematic avoidance of tax burdens that have now left countries far less prepared for the health, social, and economic crises we are experiencing. Legal tax advisory consulting firms as well comprise an illicit financial flow facilitation industry that should also be part of the panel's focus. The intertwined nature of transparency, tax justice and global governance reform 
means it is an absolute imperative that the panel maintain its breadth of focus. The arguments made by some of the richer developed economy nations at the FACTI panel's launch, uh, arguments advocating that the panel, panel's focus be limited to narrow technical discussions, lack merit because the mechanisms of tra transparency and tax equity are the same. Transparency measures are the bedrock of a system that impedes corruption, counters tax avoidance and counters tax evasion, and ensures public spending by governments is democratically accountable. There is no either or, nor can the panel achieve its mandate if, we're, if it were to accept a narrower focus or ignore the social, human rights and governance dimensions of these issues. This especially pertains to women who are disproportionately affected by the dysfunctional tax system at all levels, that is global, national and local. The FACTI panel has the potential to push forward important components of a global agenda for reform, but only by adopting a comprehensive approach. Although the panel's clusters approach recognizes the importance of global governance and the issues related to the political economy of reforms, they are not sufficiently reflected in its anticipated work program. The FACTI panel must situate all of its areas of focus within a human rights framework. That means including uh, the acknowledgement and underlining of countries' existing commitments to the sustainable development goals. It also means ensuring the panel's conclusions underpin their realization of those goals, as well as substantive gender equality uh, ambitions and militate against ongoing marginalized great marginalization and discrimination against the most vulnerable. In terms of the global ar architecture that I alluded to, the current architecture for global economic governance is fragmented. It is compartmentalized in multiple international financial institutions, some of which are privately run or private indeed, and the, the uh, range of issues affects all countries. FACTI has the opportunity to bring these together and should do so in the knowledge that developing countries are systematically underrepresented, underrepresented in most of these bodies and their interests and priorities are subordinated to those of developed countries. The bodies also underrepresent the interests of the people living in poverty. We emphasize the observation made by the G77 countries in the past year that there is still no global platform for international tax matters at the intergovernmental level and reiterate our support of their call for the UN Committee of Experts in Tax Matters to be upgraded into an intergovernmental funded body. Promoting uh, accountability is a critical aspect of this panel. There is a need to integrate tax transparency measures like automatic information exchange, comprehensive published reg public registers of beneficial ownership of legal entities and arrangements, and that means companies, trusts, foundations, cooperative societies, even li limited liability partnerships, uh, and alongside the final point of public country by country re reporting. These are viable and present in many countries and jurisdictions. G20 member Argentina last week enacted legislation to create a comprehensive register of beneficial owners, though as yet it will not be publicly available as we would advocate to interested parties, for example, parliamentary committees or investigative journalists, civil society and citizens. However, it points to the fact that key countries need not treat transparency measures as luxuries. They must see them as necessities to ensure they can meet the extraordinary fiscal challenges to come. Such mechanisms already exist that we can use and some to document financial flows that could underpin their accountability. For example, an overwhelming majority of illicit financial flows are cross-border in nature and are therefore channeled via the SWIFT financial transaction messaging system. As the FTC, we've published and endorsed a paper last year setting out the potential of this tool to reveal illicit financial flows, the first step to addressing them. This is uh, could be uh, supported if the panel were to demand public country by country reporting and that corporations uh, provide subsidiary accounts openly and free of charge so that they can be held accountable for their activities and prevent any form of tax abuse and all of its negative consequences. These measures, again, many in already in place in certain industries and regions. I would point to, for example, Transparency International's TaxTracker.eu showing financial services industry and the benefit of having country by country reporting in, in the European jurisdiction. These sorts of tools are critical to reveal the profit shifting strategies multinationals employ. 
This and the other measures cited will also be tip critical to tracking the massive wave of public expenditure seeking to preserve our livelihoods and economies right now so that we know that this taxpayer's money goes where it should and where and and we can recover it if it doesn't. Cluster three on settling disputes requires more clarity. In particular, the framing of this issue is significant. The role played by international investor state dispute, I'm going to call them ISDS mechanisms, is troubling to civil society, at least to our organization. These often violate state sovereignty and threaten social, economic and political rights. In March 2019, seven UN independent experts published a letter to the Working Group 3 on ISDS reform, highlighting these mechanisms well established incompatibility with international human rights law, underpinning an asymmetrical governance system that encroaches upon legitimate states sovereignty and fiscal space. Any dispute resolution mechanisms must be public, transparent and accountable to all parties and resist capture by one interested group of actors, public or private. Uh, finally, on asset recovery, this remains a major component of policy debates uh, around anti-corruption and transparency measures, and these are vitally important. However, their value as sources of revenue is compromised due to the absence of systematic processes of prompt, and that's a critical term, return of assets from countries that benefit from the purchase of property, art, or other high value items. Um, let me just finish, therefore, by uh, offering, uh, in, in light of what the uh, co-chair and other panelists just mentioned, it is, of course, uh, we would be very happy to take up the panelists' suggestions to submit written proposals relating to those issues raised above. I know that people were requesting very specific uh, and tangible suggestions. I've made a couple references to those, but the work of the Financial Transparency Coalition uh, incorporates uh, uh, analysis and proposals relating to these transparency measures, relating to the reform of the international architecture. Um, and therefore, I don't want to take up any more time except to thank the panel and also uh, uh, make it clear that as the FTC, we also endorse the previous comments made uh, on behalf of civil society speakers to this panel. Thank you uh, to all panelists and, and your excellency for your time. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nissan. And um, let me now have Mr. Matthias Hutter, coordinator of ONCA Coalition. So please, Mr. Hutter, you have the floor. Uh, Dr. Maki, unfortunately, he's had some trouble connecting. Can I suggest we turn to Ms. Caroline Otim, who's going to speak on behalf of the Civil Society FFD group? Uh, thank you for the flow, uh, Chair. Uh, I'll be speaking on behalf of uh, the CSO uh, FFD group. And uh, the group brings together civil society organizations, networks, and federations that are interested and are active in the financing for development. Uh, Chair, the current crisis has clearly exposed the impacts of the unbearable restrictions on the policy and fiscal space of developing countries, uh, stifled by limited financial flows and unsustainable debt burdens, as well as unlimited by multiple layers of policy conditionalities that narrows the capacity to focus on human rights and gender equality-based socioeconomic transformation strategies. The depth of uh, gender inequalities as the crisis generates, once again, a multi-layered intensified burden on women, considering all social roles where women are overrepresented and are underpaid or uh, uh, unpaid, from social reproduction to care, from daily wage earners to small business owners, from food workers to food distribution, and of course, as frontline workers in the health and social uh, sectors. This exposes how unpaid domestic and care work remains the greatest obstacle for women to access their human rights and the primary origin of economic and productive inequality stemming from sexual division of labor. Uh, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action 
uh, which was reaffirmed just last month uh, at the uh, Commission on the Status of Women, commits all countries to eradicate all forms of discrimination, including that which is driven by IFFs, tax laws and policies. Illicit financial flows, including corporate tax abuse, obstruct redistribution and drain resources that are crucial to challenging inequalities and particularly gender inequality. The African Union Assembly Special Declaration on Illicit Financial Flows highlighted the need for domestic resource mobilization and addressing illicit financial flows as central to the attainment of social and economic structural transformation of the continent. The task of the FACTI panel chair is to work towards these calls for structural transformation and not to tinker in the margins. We are therefore deeply disappointed that the first background paper of the FACTI panel does not build on the momentum of these previous high level initiatives and agreements, a call made by the Civil Society 50 group at the launch in early March. G77 and China have repeatedly called for the creation of a universal and transparent intergovernmental tax commission under the auspices of the UN, noting their concern that there is still no single globally inclusive intergovernmental forum for international tax cooperation. In addition, Africa Group has called for an international convention on tax to serve as the backbone of such a UN intergovernmental tax commission to tackle all aspects of illicit financial flows. There should be no confusion, Chair, about the clear calls for universal intergovernmental negotiation process at the UN on setting international tax standards. We are therefore deeply concerned to note the proposal instead the FACTI panel background paper is to establish a UN Financial Transparency Convention rather than a UN Tax Convention. We had already expressed concerns at the FACTI panel launch in March of the risk of high level panels being captive of narrow or selective political interests. And we reiterate our call to the FACTI panel to remain above narrow political agendas. A uh, chair, the FACTI panel background paper is also very weak on the key political issue. Exposing the democratic de deficits within supposedly global standard setting processes related to illicit financial flows. Uh, currently, international standards are being set by bodies where developing countries are only allowed to participate on the condition that they sign to existing standards and agreements that have been negotiated in non inclusive forums. And most developing countries were excluded from agenda setting, negotiations and decision making of the OECD BEPS package that was adopted by OECD and G20 in 2015. And yet developing countries are not invited to join the OECD inclusive framework and uh, only on the condition that they implement those OECD BEPS decisions that they were part of, that they were not part of negotiating. And similarly, Chair, the OECD based Global Forum on Transparency and Exchange of Information for Tax Purposes is a forum that only implements information exchange standards, including on automatic exchange of information designed and adopted by OECD and G20. It is therefore hardly surprising that 2019 IATF Financing for Sustainable Development report highlights that the OECD Common Reporting Standards on Automatic Exchange of Information has 108 members, of which only 33 are income, are middle income countries, and only one a lower uh, middle uh, country, and uh, an LDC. And similarly, OECD MCA Exchange of Country by Country reports has 74 members, of which 17 only are middle income countries and two LDCs. This is not a capacity building issue, Mr. Chair, but a reflection of standard setting processes that remain OECD led and produces standards irrelevant for most developing country contexts. Having built up on top of the tax practices within the imperial trading blocks of the 1920s, the international tax system has historically been against developing country interests. 
The direction of current reforms within OECD processes only reinforces the status quo of an international tax system built in the 1920s. The impacts of this broken international tax system has felt most accurately, acutely by most marginalized section of society who face a greater risk of rights abuses, along with the lack of adequate public spending on key areas that would improve equality, including gender equality and women's rights. We therefore disagree with the assertion in the Facti panel background notes that the above OECD led reforms from the past 10 years represent a major change in international tax cooperation. Mr. Chair, in this context, the rationale for Facti Panel's prioritization of the third cluster on cooperation and settling dis disputes remains unclear. The terms disputes and non-cooperation are often related to mechanisms such as secret binding arbitration or highly political blacklisting processes that target developing countries who choose not to abide by rules set by the OECD and G20. These approaches are highly concerning and should not be promoted or legitimized. This cluster could have instead been more clearly focused on global governance gaps to ensure adequate analysis and contextualization of the key issues of systematic exclusion of developing countries from standard setting processes. On international tax, Mr. Chair, the key challenge is ensuring that standards and solutions are easy to administer to prevent disputes. The Committee of Experts on International Cooperation in Tax Matters, uh, this, uh, the UN Tax Committee, as, as we all know it, has recommended that from a developing country's point of view, the solution to the issue of taxing profits of digitalized businesses should be simple to administer as developing countries often neither have the capacity to administer complex solution or are, or are they equipped to handle uh, costly international dispute settlement processes. Trying to fix dispute settlements before addressing the relevance of global standards for developing country context is putting the cart before the horse. And Mr. Chair, we reiterate once again that the central issue is not the need for counting beans, but to overcome the obstinate blocking by some OECD member states on establishing a UN process to negotiate international tax standards. We hope the FACTI panel will focus more on giving impetus to this political process and thereby encourage member states to start moving in this direction. Uh, thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much for your comments and your concerns. Um, now, Peter, uh, who do we have on the uh, list? So we have the UNCAC coalition. Uh, the, unfortunately, the coordinator couldn't uh, connect, but we have the chair on the line, so he will speak okay. next, Mr. David Benassar. Okay, so you have the floor, Mr. Please go ahead, David. Um, ah, there we go. You, you just muted your, there you go. Okay, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, and uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here. I represent, my name is David Benassar, and I represent the UNCAC Coalition. Uh, unfortunately, our coordinator, Matthias Huterk, was not able to connect today. Uh, the UNCAC Coalition is a coalition of over 300 civil society organizations around the world that work on the, moni on the monitoring and implementation of the UNCAC uh, Convention. Um, we welcome the panel's uh, emphasis on transparency as one of its uh, key areas of focus. And uh, let us, uh, let me present a few of the uh, priority areas uh, where we think that uh, transparency uh, and the free flow of information uh, will be crucial in fighting corruption and, and uh, limiting uh, financial flows. Uh, the first, as many other speakers have already said, is around beneficial ownership. We agree that there is a crucial need for all states to implement, uh, create and implement public uh, 
online registers of beneficial owners of companies of and of other legal entities uh, that are open to the public, that are timely, that are accurate, that have effective verification and sanctions for non-compliance. And the same should apply for company registers of other kinds of legal entities. Uh, and ideally, these would all have a common data standard so that uh, the public, the, so that investigators, so that journalists would be able to uh, freely identify and combine information and uh, share this information in a way that makes it useful to identify corruption and corrupt flows uh, and to help take action to stop that. Uh, in addition to that, we see emerging good practice in countries where they have uh, companies that are uh, doing procurement are required to identify their public, uh, their beneficial owners publicly uh, so that the public and uh, officials have a better sense of who it is they're actually doing business with. Second, uh, we call for the adequate oversight and high level transparency of public budgets and budget implementation. Uh, this especially is important around public procurement and public contracts. Uh, to ensure full access to all documentation, including the contracts uh, and any additional materials on the contracts, as well as on their implementation. Uh, and the best practice on that that has been adopted in a number of countries so far is around using the open contracting data standard as a as a technical means to to show the public. Uh, other good practices around that, uh, for instance, in Slovakia, where the public contracts do not become in force until they are actually published on a website uh, so that anybody can see the terms of the contract. Uh, another thing, uh, another area that we believe is quite important uh, is around the funding of public campaigns and political parties, that all information related to who is funding political parties and political candidates is made public. Uh, above a certain threshold. Finally, uh, around enforcement of corruption offenses, including bribery, uh, is to make more information available about what public officials are, uh, what public bodies are actually doing for enforcement. Uh, while Article 10 of the UNCAC Convention has uh, requirements for states to make information available, uh, in practice, it's often quite difficult, if not impossible, to discover uh, what has been enforced against whom uh, and to what end. And then finally, uh, we believe it's essential to protect uh, other sources of information, namely uh, whistleblowers uh, and those that are conducting investigative journalism or investigations uh, for civil society organizations. Uh, the UNCAC Convention suggests that countries should adopt comprehensive whistleblower protection laws, uh, or at least protection laws related to corruption. Uh, but uh, in reality, only 30 countries around the world have adopted comprehensive whistleblower laws now. Uh, and uh, while many others have very limited provisions in their anti-corruption laws, which are little or no use in really protecting people. Civil society organizations and journalists uh, around the world have been facing increased threats. Uh, most of the deaths of journalists that are not directly related to war zones can really be attributed to those who have identified uh, corruption uh, and then have faced retaliation because of that corruption. Uh, we have a number of other suggestions uh, around other things around the UNCAC convention and implementation, which we'll be happy to submit as a uh, written statement. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Banisa, and uh, we'll be happy to receive your written inputs. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Peter? Uh, Yes, so Dr. Maki, I have had two of our panel members indicate they would like to respond. Uh, we Perfect. have Mr. Mr. Shahid Qadar and uh, 
Ms. Magdalena Sepulveda, they'll have to turn their video on um, mm -hmm. so that I can uh, broadcast them, but they can speak as soon as they are unmuted. So I'll let Ms. Uh, Mr. Kadar ask me first, so. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, let, me Mr. Kadar. Uh, let me play devil's advocate. Let me play devil's advocate to the civil society organizations. Uh, we are, uh, 2020, by the, by the time 2020 ends, and the impact uh, in terms of the economies on developing countries uh, actually continues to be a huge burden even in 2021. That will only give us nine years going forward. Uh, so my question to the, uh, the presenters is why we can continue to work on illicit financial flows, a far better and a far more effective way to achieve uh, the kind of flaws that we are referring to is to talk about debt write-offs and link them with expenditure on the SDGs. Now, um, so I'd like your response on that. Considering the time frame, I'm not saying you give up on these uh, efforts. These must continue, but given that we only have nine years uh, and, and to achieve those, it would be far easier to get that going and link it with expenditures on SDGs. My second question is really to an intervention from a friend from Transparency International. I keep hearing the phrase global ad asset register. Um, and the reason I mention the, de the debt part, just to remind ourselves, and everyone's been saying that, because the standards, the processes, um, the mechanisms, the institutional structures for implementation are all in the control of the OECD countries. So for us to actually achieve these objectives in the time frame that we are referring to is really being far too ambitious given the time frame. Going to back, back to this whole question of the global address registry, given assets are so highly dispersed and fragmented, what is their proposal? in a realistic political and institutional sense, because all these institutions are very fragmented when it comes to it. What do the, uh, say our friends from Transparency International think is the way forward in a, being able to set up a global registry? Thank you. Yes, we, we have a thank you very much, Mr. Kadar. So we have a second panelist, uh, Mrs. Sepulveda. Thank you very much, Mr. Kutcher. Uh, I would like to thank the contribution of all civil society representatives uh, this morning in this very uh, rich contribution to the panel. I would like to uh, stress that you have made evident that it is not possible for uh, an independent panel like this to move forward without a direct and regular mechanism where we can hear from civil society organizations uh, and we can hear your concerns and your input. Um, I would like to stress, as, the, as, as our co-chair has uh, mentioned it uh, this morning, that we are not just ticking the box regarding the consultation with civil society organizations. We are taking your concerns uh, very seriously and they are going to meaningfully uh, inform uh, our discussion. Having said that, I also would like to stress that several of the points that Can you, can, can you unmute, please? Okay. I'm, I'm truly sorry for that. I, I will uh, start again. I would like to thank the contribution of all civil society representatives uh, this morning. I think that for all the rich contributions to the, to the debate, I think that you have made clear that it's not possible for a panel uh, like this to move forward without a very uh, regular and direct uh, mechanism to receive input from civil society organizations. Uh, I would like to stress, as the co-chair mentioned this morning, that uh, with this uh, consultation, we're not just ticking the box regarding the consultation with civil society organizations. We're taking your concerns uh, very seriously and they're going to meaningfully inform the discussion of the panel. 
uh, we are independent panelists and actually we welcome all the constructive criticisms that uh, you have uh, raised this morning and the new ideas and proposal for uh, for our work. Having said that, I would also like to uh, give you some guarantees that several Can you unmute again? Magdalena, you went on mute again. Yeah. Uh, sorry, I don't know what is happening uh, and it's unmuting some sort of uh, alone. Um, okay. So I would like to ensure, I would like to give you some assurances that sub, several of the topics that has been discussed this morning has been already within the discussions that we have had uh, within the panel. Uh, as my uh, predecessor just mentioned with questions about the global registry, it has been discussed uh, internally, combating secrecy um, and uh, also the issues that were mentioned by several of you regarding governance issues. I think that uh, the systematic exclusion of developing countries on issues of governance related to uh, international uh, finance, finan financing and uh, issues of uh, taxes, it is a main issues that of course has to be addressed uh, by this panel. And I think that this is a discussion that we have already raised under cluster, uh, our third cluster in the way in which we have divided, divided our work. Uh, once again, I would say uh, that I also would like to specifically thank all the all your concerns regarding the important to link this work with uh, other work related to human rights and in particularly uh, regarding substantive gender equality. Um, I agree with uh, those who have spoken about uh, the issue and I think that it is critically important to incorporate uh, these issues in the discussion of the panel as suggested by several of your presentation. Thank you very much and apologies for uh, for the unmuting uh, myself several times. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for these uh, these comments. Uh, Peter, is Mr. Luis Moreno uh, present? Uh, no, uh, so Caroline was speaking on behalf of the CSO group, so um, I think that that he because he was unable to join so and we still okay. have not had uh sharon burrow able to join so i think we might move to the open discussion point yes now. Uh, we have, i think we can move okay so yes we have a we have a number of people who are ready to make interventions perfect so we can move to the open discussion and uh, mr kadar even anticipated on the open discussion by asking a question to Transparency International on what kind of concrete recommendation they would make on the Global Assets Registry. Maybe we can open by this uh, question and then have several other questions on Cluster 3 because Cluster 3 was also quite uh, intensively debated. So, uh, can we uh, go to Transparency International? I am ready. Yes, thank you very much for 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 the question, uh, Mr. Carter. So uh, to begin with, as I made clear in my presentation, we are asking for an exp uh, exploration for the need to look into this topic. We're not saying that we're coming here. If we had a solution, uh, of course, it would be very easy. Uh, and the, the ask, uh, the reason for why we're asking for a global assets registry. Uh, is to put it on the agenda and drive it forward. It is an ambitious ask, yes, but it needs to be addressed. And the, the realization of this lifts it on a national level and it builds from a bottom up. Um, and, and, and there is a need, I said, I used the term a seismic shift, and uh, I, I think that's the, the right way of looking at it. Like, like our economies have been disrupted over the last 20 years, uh, now, even more so with, with the COVID and, and uh, the recession or worse that is to come, we need to be just as ambitious in looking in how we, we disrupt um, the, the illicit financial flows. 
uh, we have a team in, in, in our secretariat looking at various ways forward in this. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I cannot give you uh, the recipe uh, just yet, but uh, we're very happy to be uh, in close contact with you and, and collaborate on this topic. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm. Uh, so Would the panelists like, yes, please. Oh, I was Peter? gonna, oh yeah, sorry, I, go ahead. I was gonna indicate who we have on the list waiting to speak. Yes, please. Uh, so we have Miss mm. Laura Rousseau, uh, and then yes. after her we have, uh, sorry, I lost my track of the list. Uh, we have Miss Emilia Reyes. Um, who have connected and are ready to go. OK, so they have the floor. So. The test that we, this is Russo, eh? this Russo. Hello. Um, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, it's OK. Yes, we can hear you well. Please go yes, ahead. Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Thank you. So firstly, thank you for the invitation. I work for the French NGO Sherpa uh, based in Paris uh, and created in order to protect and defend victims of economic crimes. Um, as we developed an expertise on the issue of bien malaki uh, with the first complaint before French courts, uh, one um, of uh, Sherpa case issue is the return of assets. Um, but it, as mentioned, it's, uh, it faces several obstacles. For example, the choice of the project to fund with the restitution, the monitoring of the restitution, and the lack of international definition of victim of corruption, creating a confusion between states and spoiled population sometimes. Strong and practical recommendations have to be thinking and creating and take into account the civil society and especially uh, the civil society of the spoiled countries. Besides regarding corruption, um, corruption is hard to evidence and uh, we can think about the reversal of burden of proof uh, in order to facilitate the prosecution of this, in, uh, of this infraction. Then regarding money laundering, the role of financial intermediaries in money laundering, such as audit and accounting firm banks, law firms is fundamental. They use tax and secrecy events to circumvent rules and launder money from illicit origin for the benefit of their clients. Despite their complicit behavior, their use of tax haven makes them impossible to sanction under the existing preventive anti-money laundering rule. Major audit firms are still under-regulated with respect to preventive, preventive AML obligation, as the Lwambalix revealed. It seems really hard to sue them or to regulate them. More, moreover, tax evasion undermines the, finance, the financing of public services and therefore the completion of human rights, such as the right, of, uh, the right to health uh, tax evasion is made possible by tax evasion. But the list of official tax even omit to include some countries and are not efficient at all. And tax even is often seen as a lawful optimization practices, which, which makes it impossible to suppress and sanction. Also, tax even evasion must be qualified and san sanctioned as a violation of human and envir environmental rights. United Nations human rights committees such as the Economic and Social, Social Rights Committee could be more active with this regard. And finally, the lack of independence of prosecuting authorities may block prosecution of corruption allegations. To overcome it, civil society organizations working on illicit financial flows should file complaints with liberal admissibility conditions for their complaints. 
illicit financial flow scandals are revealed by journalists and human rights defenders, whistleblowers, sometimes at the expense of their lives, even in Europe. I think about Maltese journalist Daphne, for example. We need an international minimum standard of protection for human rights defenders and journalists. Thank you for listening. It was very short and I, I will be happy to send you more detailed information and, and proposition in writing. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, Ms. Rousseau, and we'll be delighted to receive your written contributions. Thank you. So, um, we go to the next speaker. Emilia, you have the floor. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Emilia Reyes. I'm speaking um, on behalf of the Women's Working Group on FFB, and I'm part of the feminist Mexican organization called Equidad de Género, Ciudadanía, Trabajo y Familia. Um, the Women's Working Group on FFB would like to call on you to make explicit the necessary overarching principles that a panel under the UN has to have that should work as technical guidelines and aims in themselves. First, to promote, protect, and fulfill human rights, including collective rights, such as the rights of indigenous peoples and labor rights. Second, women's human rights and gender equality should be addressed as macroeconomic challenges interrelated with the matters being discussed, including the issue of unpaid domestic and care work, the true layer subsidizing the entire global economy. Your background paper omitted to link the dimension of inequalities, especially those of structural and historical nature, with the topics being addressed, as if the entire axis of the work was missing. For what are we interested in figures and data, if not to make a meaningful transformation? The world being shut down and facing an impossible recession should trigger you enough to promote those unthinkable but most needed global reforms. This is why we ask you to do the right thing, leading the work towards redistributive justice. We expect of you to fulfill your historical role, which is clearer now more, more now than ever, all of us being under quarantine. Our health systems in developing countries with no fiscal floors. You are expected to deliver what humanity needs the most, the possibility to refrain the obscene corporate tax avoidance and tax abuse. Financial accountability, transparency and integrity should serve but to one aim, to signal the path which with governments are able to do domestic resource mobilization, to play with those terms, to politically distort concepts or to delay action would be unpardonable right now with a famine knocking on our, on our doors. Thus, we fully endorse the statement delivered on behalf of the CSFFD group, and we emphasize the urgent call for a UN tax convention in the lead up to a UN intergovernmental tax commission to tackle all aspects of illicit financial flows. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, thank you very much for raising the expectations that you have regarding the, the panel and uh, I can assure you that equity uh, is uh, the key value of all these processes. Uh, next speaker, uh, Peter. Thank you. So I have coming up Alex Cobham and then Jean Saldana and then I have uh, Susana Ruiz. OK, so, so please. Mm -hmm. So uh, thank you, co-chair uh, and panel yes, for the, the opportunity to speak. Um, your work is, is crucial and most timely uh, in these in these strange times. The Tax Justice Network was formed um, almost two decades ago and put forward then what remained the crucial elements to, to fix the global architecture for tax and financial integrity, motiv motivated by the recognition that uh, tax injustice does systematic damage to human rights, especially women's rights, um, and across a whole range of intersectional inequalities. Those technical fixes include a shift to unitary taxation for multinational companies, and the universal introduction of uh, what we call the ABC of tax transparency, A for automatic exchange of financial uh, information, information on financial accounts, 
B for beneficial ownership transparency through public registers joined up into a global asset registry and C for public country by country reporting by multinational companies to reveal the scale of their profit shifting. But while these detailed technical solutions are required, the question of whether the world chooses to implement these is fundamentally not a technical question, but a political one. And that's the question that the FACTI panel really confronts now. For decades, the former imperial powers that dominate the OECD have set the rules for international tax and the architecture for financial transparency. The position in which we now find ourselves is the position that these rich countries have chosen, have created. And that position is one in which tax abuse by multinational companies and other forms of corruption are not marginal activities, but are actually central to the global economy. Now, all serious estimates, whether they're from researchers at the Tax Justice Network, at UNCTAD or the International Monetary Fund, show that the costs of tax abuse are disproportionately higher in lower income countries, the very countries that are denied an effective voice at the OECD and the right to participate fully in information exchange and in rule setting. So the FACTI panel faces one clear challenge in addition to dealing with the technical issues, and that's how to outline a truly global governance alternative at the United Nations to oversee effective responses to tax abuse and illicit flows. And that must take the form of a new UN tax convention and rule setting forum. Genuinely multilateral information exchange and rule setting has the potential to eliminate the grave inequalities in taxing rights between countries, to curb gross inequalities within societies, including those rooted in gender and racial injustice, and to empower the type of revenue raising for public spending that the pandemic has highlighted is crucial for all of our health. We wish the FACTI panel well in this, and of course we stand ready to support in any way we can on both the technical and the political questions. Thank you. Th thank you very much for your contribution, uh, Mr. Koba. Um, Peter, uh, uh, next speaker. We have Miss Jean Sadana. Okay. Jean, go ahead. You have the floor, thank yeah. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, we, yes, can, we can hear you. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. My name is Jean Soldana, and I'm the director of Eurodad, which is the European Network on Debt and Development. I'd like to relate my points to three clusters of the work, the three clusters of the work of the FACTA panel. Uh, first of all, in relation to cluster one, um, We'd like to, first of all, emphasize the need for a clear definition of what is meant by cooperation. As Eurodad, we believe that the cornerstone of international cooperation must be about ensuring that when global tax standards are set, all governments must show willingness to engage in an open and transparent negotiation, which is supported by a neutral secretariat where all countries can participate on a truly equal footing. And for this to happen, we think an intergovernmental tax body has to be established under the auspices of the United Nations. Another key important uh, point that we missed from the background document was with regard to the intergovernmental UN tax body. We would recommend, Mr. Chair, instead of upgrading the existing UN expert committee to an intergovernmental body, um, to set up a new intergovernmental body as a commission under the ECOSOC, which would allow the current expert body to continue as an expert committee that can support international decision making. Under cluster two, first of all, we would recommend exploring the political and practical obstacles that have until now prevented many developing countries and in particular least developing countries from becoming part of automatic information exchange systems. Secondly, we would encourage the panel to assess how the global asset register, which has been discussed this afternoon, might be able to resolve some of the, these obstacles and ensure that all countries get access to the information they need to combat activities such as tax evasion and corruption. Finally, in relation to cluster three, 
we would recommend, especially in relation to unfair or ineffective global tax rules, as well as over overly bureaucratic transparency rules, that the panel not only explore whether all countries are following international rules, but also investigate how these rules were negotiated and whether they reflect the realities and interests of developing countries, and in particular, least developed countries. With this regard, I appreciate the remarks of panelist uh, Magdalena Supervieda about emphasizing the need to address governance issues in the, the panel. We also encourage the panel to be aware of the risks of negative impacts on developing countries, which can result from measures such as politically driven blacklisting processes or mandatory binding arbitration. Finally, as a cross cutting issue, we would join our voice to express concerns that the issue of gender equality does not currently seem to be integrated enough into the work of the panel. We would stress the importance of ensuring that the panel does not become gender blind, but instead ensures that a gender lens is applied to all its work. We would be very, very happy to put our work uh, at your disposal and remain at your disposal for any other questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Saldana, and please do not hesitate to provide to the panel uh, uh, the essentials and the synthesis of your work. Uh, it will be very much appreciated. Uh, thank you. Uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Peter. Here we have uh, Ms. Susanna Ruiz from uh, Oxfam International. Okay. Yes. Ms. Ruiz, you have a floor. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Good morning, uh, Co-Chair, and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, domestic revenue mobilization uh, is the cornerstone of, to financing the SDGs, maybe on life support very, very soon. The pandemic is intensifying the need for funding, while most of countries are uh, watching their tax revenue shrink. Uh, in, in a recent interview, Ghana's Minister of Finance was recognizing that the country has already lost uh, $1 billion in tax revenue. It's more than the entire uh, budget for health in the, in the country last year. And this is not only a problem for, uh, for Ghana, of course, uh, fiscal crisis will accelerate in almost every developing country. So in this context, what why tax matters and uh, for uh, for facty panel we we should not limit to transparency issues as our point i mean uh, transparency is essential definitely but it's only a, a means towards increased and fair taxation it's not an and end in itself. The UN Convention on Financial Transparency as a facty background paper proposes will fail to deliver what is needed at uh, this moment. And then what is needed at this moment, I mean, to put it simple, <laughs> we need a full transformation of the global tax system. Um, it is essential that uh, facty panel to recognize that this pandemic is not creating new tax pr problems, rather it's shining a bright light on the problem that um, the current tax system has already created. And now the risk is that we are exacerbating uh, those uh, trends. In a way, the 2008 uh, global financial crisis was a window of opportunity to reverse some of the imbalances of the of the past and to some extent also the OECD BEPS uh, process was a response from the international community but BEPS process was bringing high expectation but quite disappointing process with very poor outcomes because OECD process uh, has a very clear limitation it is a process designed by rich countries for rich countries. The proposals on the on the table have been designed to comply with the reality and interest of business structures in rich countries. So developing countries have been historically underrepresented in number, but also in political power. The inclusive framework uh, can be viewed as an improvement with close to 140 countries now participating, but uh, only in terms of numbers. For developing countries, being a member is uh, nothing like being equal in terms of uh, effectively influencing the, the standard. So the current, in this current context, uh, the FACTI panel must solve uh, such uh, so those uh, imbalances and deliver radical but implementable reforms to simplify the international tax system. It has to be made by people on the same level with similar limitations and with equal interest. 
the Facti panel can, um, from the very beginning, be the change we need to recover these fairness, and it cannot waste uh, it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Rodriguez. Mm, um, your points are well taken. Uh, Peter? Uh, so yes. I have three people who have joined, uh, but I can see that Irene would like to make a comment. Maybe we could pause for some faculty panel okay. members to respond. Okay, I, I think we, we should pause and, and uh, it's a good idea. And um, as well, faculty panel members to respond. Well, uh, I sense two, if I'm wrong, you will correct me, uh, two global categories of questions. Uh, one set of questions have to do with uh, sp the specific clusters, the free clusters. And then there is another set of questions which has to do with the global governance issues and that uh, 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 dimension of political issues versus technical, which uh, are uh, somehow and uh, uh, um, uh, in order to question some of the content of a background paper. So there are, in my view, these two sets of questions. And there is a, a, a point which is uh, which has been reaffirmed, and I, I think all the panel members agree with that. Uh, the, the issue of uh, of gender equality. Um, the fact that we shouldn't be gender blind, I think this is uh, a very uh, 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 important, critical and uh, issue that needs to be taken into account. So, uh, panel members, esteemed colleagues, uh, you have the floor. Thank, thank you, Chair, and thank you very much as well to the participants who have just spoken. Um, you, you've, you've addressed some of the, the questions that have been raised in, in your brief intervention, Chair, but I just want to add to that um, because a, a number of issues have related to, uh, to the defining of the interpretation of, of the work of the panel. Um, and I could speak just to cluster one and cluster three. I, I am in, in cluster one, which is led by Jose Ocampo, and in his address uh, earlier, Last, late last week, there were some areas that he did outline that the, the first cluster will be looking at. So it will not just look at the question of of, um, of cooperation, but look a little bit in more depth at the substance in tax matters. Um, issues such as the international legal instruments uh, with universal participation, as opposed to voluntary schemes. And he gave he cited examples such as the OECD BEPS process. Uh, the allocation of taxing rights, so interrogating that, and that looks at the issue of, of uh, inequality in taxing rights between countries. And, and he links this to the question of mobility of capital and the, the growth and development of multinational enterprises uh, and the questions around the, the digitalization of the economy and uh, where substantial profits are made. Uh, the other areas that he, he, he outlined that this First cluster would look at include tax avoidance and evasion and mechanisms to stop them and also to build capacity of governments to stop them. And the last two related to institutions, for example, interrogating about uh, uh, whether the UN Tax Committee uh, can be upgraded. And today there's been an, another proposal which is not about upgrading but about setting up of a separate body under ECOSOC and what would be the role of the UN centrally within international tax cooperation and rule setting. And uh, finally, he talked about the areas to do with the ensuring that there's reliable global data as a cross-cutting issue that uh, supports issues around uh, asset recovery and uh, ending corruption. So these are some of the substantive issues within cluster one, and I think they relate to many of the concerns that have been raised by colleagues here. And on cluster three, uh, 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 which is around um, cooperation and uh, dispute settlement, I think that it, uh, in the discussions that we've had within that cluster, we have recognized that it is important to interrogate both existing mechanisms 
and how those existing mechanisms actually relate to different contexts of countries, both um, high income countries, middle income and low income countries. So looking at whether they are relevant to the different contexts of those countries, the realities, um, and, and, and not just look at it from the perspective of building capacity of those countries to use them, but whether the mechanisms themselves relate to the different to the different contexts. And uh, we also consider that we look at issues such as the, the enforcement and compliance mechanisms as a as a key barrier in relation to mechanisms that actually are functional and relate to different contexts, but also interrogating issues relating to relating to uh, international investment agreements, um, DTAs, bilateral investment treaties, and the and the impact that these have on the uh, on the on sovereignty and policy space at national level, and in the sense that they often define treatment for foreign investors and specify standards of treatment relating to them. So how do these impact on national level um, infrastructure for dispute settlement, for example, use of national judicial spaces and uh, institutions. So it will look not, not only at cooperation, but also interrogate the, the relevance of, of the, the mechanisms that exist at a global level. One important point that has been raised today, with which uh, I, I, I take an, an issue that we therefore have to also consider more closely, is around the fragmentation of the various mechanisms and how they can be coherence, coherence built um, at a global level. Uh, and, and that again does link very closely to the question of the role of uh, intergovernmental space and uh, international architecture around this area. Thank you. The, the thank, thank you very much, Irene. You want to add something? You, you need to unmute. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry. I think I muted and and then unmuted and then muted. I think just to 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 agree that the relevance, the connection between all of this and domestic resource mobilization ultimately is around the welfare of society. So the social issues, the issues around um, gender and human rights fundamentally remain the, the, the bedrock of this uh, of this process and is therefore to be reflected in our analysis. Thank you. Okay. Can, thank, you. Um, thank you very much. I'm yes. How I raise my hand. Can I, can I say something? Yeah. Yes, okay. uh, Susan, please. Um, yes, um, so I'm particularly um, uh, concerned with the issue of corruption, but I, I wanted to just say a couple of things in response to the uh, important comments that people were making. Um, that there's a lot of the agenda here has to do with money, has to do with the flow of money um, out of of poor countries into the financial uh, centers, uh, and money flowing the other direction in, in the form of investment or or whatever. Right, so. The, some of the focus is simply on that, right? But then there is, of course, the issues raised by many of you, which is how is that money going to be used uh, when it uh, returns to a country, or who is it that's particularly being harmed by the uh, failure of companies to pay uh, their fair share of taxes or the um, outflows that are caused by by um, by corruption, and that's a a very important question that needs to be in the background, but it isn't exactly something that can be uh, the the actual way in which the countries themselves are spending the money is is has to do with the role of gender and poverty and um, all sorts of other other issues inside the country. And the question is the role of the of international control of financial flows on those things, and that's that's not an easy. Um, set of questions to to um, uh, uh, to deal with. So I think it's to and, and the third point, I guess, is that there are, of course, many very poor countries that don't have the nice problem of financial flows. Uh, they're just extremely poor. And so there is a second question or third question of whether we should be thinking also about the the countries that are right now 
not um, not dealing with financial flows uh, and are therefore probably particularly at, at risk uh, to uh, with respect to the, uh, the sustainable uh, development uh, goals uh, going forward. So we have to keep in mind, I think, over time, the relationship, I mean, over our deliberations, the relationship between this focus on flows of money and where they're going, uh, but um, we're not going to be able to recommend that it all go into education, for example, even if we might think that was a you know, nice idea. So thank you. Uh, th thank you very much, uh, Susan. Would any other panel member like to intervene or we go to a second, to another list of speakers? I'd like to intervene, Annette here. Please. Mm. Yeah, I, I would like to commend uh, the members of civil society uh, that have made the valuable contributions to the panel and uh, as the other panel members have said, uh, we would be, we will take on board the ideas that you have tabled before us. Uh, for now, I just wanted to reiterate um, the concerns that have been raised about uh, the cluster number one, and that is the one on um, international improving cooperation in tax matters. And one of the issues that you have raised is the need to really understand what cooperation is and how to get all countries uh, cooperate in improving tax matters. We can't have a system where we expect all countries to cooperate where we do not have a body like all of you have been indicating that literally sets the rules and is unbiased. So we need neutrality as you have already said and that should be a body that actually sets the standards and when the standards are set all countries comply with them and consensus should be gathered from all those countries without having a situation where um, that we have right now where we have um, uh, developing developed countries for example setting the rules and at the same time they are benefiting the rules so we have a situation right now where we have two centers of power the UN, the OECD, for example, and the EU when it comes to blacklisting of tax havens. I think that is a situation that is untenable as we go along. Um, if we are going to have an inclusive framework that is set up by the OECD and then the EU comes in and uses the policies that have been set up by the OEC to blacklist countries that are not complying, that kind of situation cannot proceed. So when we talk about international tax cooperation, those are some of the issues that you've raised that we'll put into consideration to see how cooperation can actually be tangible and is not cooperation that is uh, driving the interests of some countries at the expense of others. So we are uh, we appreciate your comments in that regard. And those are some of the issues that will form the backdrop of um, the, the issues will be um, uh, tabling in the report that will be drafting, at least from the tax matters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, um, so maybe we could go to another round list of speakers, uh, Peter. Yes, Dr. Maki, we have, I think, six people left, and perhaps if we ask them to be two minutes, really under two minutes each, we can just run over about five, ten minutes and 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 conclude. Yeah, um, yeah it is so, true because we have run out of time. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. So I'm going to okay. I'm going to read off the list of six that I've got and then hopefully they will be ready to go. So I have Sergio mm -hmm. Chaparro. I have Dina um, Musin Dardway. I apologize if I've done your name wrong. Tom Cardamon um, and then I've got Ikal Angele, I hope I pronounced that right as well. Um, and then I have Clark Gazgon, and then I think I had one more. Um, uh, no, I think that's actually it. Oh, sorry, Marvi Mizolas. So if they can all go in less than two minutes, then we can get everybody in before we conclude. Okay. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Peter. So, okay, please. Mm. 
Thank you very much, Peter and Mr. Chair. On behalf of the Center for Economic and Social Rights, we appreciate the opportunity to share our views on the issues the FACTI panel is addressing that have everything to do with current increasing inequalities and human rights deprivations, disproportionately impacting global South countries as the COVID-19 crisis has shown. As we speak, women, indigenous peoples, informal workers and other marginalized populations all over the world are experiencing preventable human suffering as a consequence of, of, of systemic failures of global economic governance that impose se severe constraints on low and middle income countries fiscal space to tackle COVID and other challenges. That's why the main point we would like to make is that the FACTI panel must situate its three areas of focus within a human rights framework and particularly taking into account states' extraterritorial human rights obligations. According to these obligations, all states have a duty to ensure their actions do not cause, uh, don't, do not cause foreseeable harm beyond their borders, nor hamper the ability of other countries to honor their human rights obligations. Individually and as members of international financial institutions, states have a duty to cooperate internationally to safeguard the rights of those most, most at risk. Drawing on these obligations, we would like to make three comments. Uh, first, although some states will have like a more restricted mandate for the FACTI panel, the panel cannot ignore that illicit financial flows, tax abuse, harmful tax competition, and the lack of financial transparency are impeding the fulfillment of human rights as OHCHR and various human rights mechanisms have recognized for a long time. Hence, further action is needed by the international community to fix the fragmented institutional architecture and the lack of adequate representation of the lower income countries and most impacted populations under this architecture to address these problems. That's why we reiterate our support to G20, G77's call for the UN Committee of Experts in Tax Matters to be upgraded into an intergovernmental funded body and the adoption of a new UN tax convention. It is not realistic to say that in order to make the best use of its mandate, the panel should focus only on addressing weaknesses of current frameworks instead of looking at systemic gaps and how to fix them. Some failures of the current system are threatening the very core abilities of lower income states to comply with their human rights obligations. For example, if the leading estimates for the tax losses uh, loses to both corporate and individual tax abuse, which leans on massive private, private corruption schemes, show that these account for a much higher share of current tax revenues in lower income countries, then compliance for these states with their obligations of mobilizing the maximum available resources uh, on the, uh, uh, for, for the full realization of human rights under the current tax rules becomes a chimera. Therefore, the FACTI panel should reflect further on what reforms are needed to comply with Article 28 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, according to which states must contribute to creating an international environment that enables the fulfillment of human rights. As the UN Committee on Economic and Social Rights states in its general comment on business and human rights, to that end, states' parties must take the necessary steps to promote and help create such an environment on tax and financial matters. For example, to combat abusive tax practice by transnational corporations, states should deepen international tax cooperation and explore the possibility to tax multinational groups of companies as single firms, as ECRIT has proposed. Um, providing excessive protection for bank secrecy and may, uh, may affect the ability of states where economic activities are taking place to meet their obligations to mobilize the maximum available resources for the implementation of human rights. Finally, as several UN independent human rights experts has stated, ISDS compounds an asymmetrical system that encroaches upon the state's policy space to protect human rights. For example, ISDS undermines tax justice through three channels, depriving states of significant resources that go into corporations' pockets instead of financing human rights fulfillment, impeding the adoption of progressive tax measures that have been revoked as a consequence of ISDS decisions, and preventing states from exercising tax sovereignty due to fears of being sued by corporations. Therefore, a truly independent, symmetric, transparent, and accountable dispute resolution mechanism needs, uh, needs to be adopted. We look forward to have more opportunities to provide more documentation on this and other issues in support of the work of the panel. Thank you. Th thank you uh, very much, Mr. Chaparro. Uh, uh, the next speaker, Go ahead, Dina, you're, you're, we're ready for you. 
Thank you very much. My name is Dina Musindarezo and I work with Humankind Worldwide. We are also members of the Civil Society, uh, Civil Society on Financing for Development and also the members of the Women Working Group on Financing for Development and therefore we do support the statement that have been delivered by these two groups uh, in this meeting. Uh, I also want to reiterate that uh, we do support uh, the establishment of the UN Intergovernmental Convention uh, that will enable member states to equally contribute to issues of tax, international tax standards, especially knowing that uh, the current model is actually affecting most of the countries and the global south more disproportionately. Uh, second, uh, we do call upon uh, the panel to definitely broaden uh, the mandate to cover the issues of the international governance architecture, uh, as other speakers have, have talked about, to ensure that uh, the systematic and structural issues are addressed. Uh, because we know that it, uh, the women face the brunt of the current uh, inequalities um, that we see through illicit financial flows, uh, the tax abuse, and the current debt structure. Uh, I think that COVID-19 has showed us that when uh, we have a crisis in the system, the current system we have in place are not viable and cannot actually sustain and, and protect, especially the most vulnerable. Uh, we have seen that much as COVID-19 is affecting all people, uh, women, especially in the Global South, are uh, disproportionately affected in terms of unpaid care work, in terms of the increased, form, uh, increased forms of violence against women and girls, uh, but also women, uh, majority of which work in the informal sector, are disproportionately affected by the current crisis. Uh, states in the Global South find themselves in a situation where they, they are not able to uh, respond to the current crisis, mainly because of underfunding of the public uh, services such as the health system, the social protection uh, systems, but also infrastructure around unpaid care work and domestic work. Uh, therefore, it is important to actually ensure that this panel uh, ensures the gender analysis and tackles the issues uh, affecting women's rights, ensures that states have a conducive environment that enables them to mobilize um, maximum available resources uh, to uh, tackle issues of inequalities generally and gender inequalities specifically uh, as, as committed uh, uh, in different international commitments such as the Convention on Elimination of um, Discrimination Against Women, the Beijing Declaration Platform for Action, but also on other broad uh, UN conventions such as the International Convention on Social, Economic uh, and Cultural Rights. Uh, and finally, I call upon the panel to ensure that there is a, fr a framework of engagement that ensures that different voices are heard, and especially uh, women's race organization based in the Global South. Um, and these are going to provide the expertise and experiences necessary uh, to ensure that the issues affecting a majority of, of citizens, and especially women and girls in the Global South, uh, are brought for, forward uh, for, the, for the panel's consideration. Uh, at Womankind, we work with the women's rights organizations in the Global South and we stand ready to support you in terms of bringing that analysis and experiences uh, that are going to enrich the outcomes of the panel. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lucinda Wezo. So the next uh, speaker, um, Peter. Uh, we have Tom, Tom Cardamon. Yes, okay. uh, thank you to Please. the panel for your important work and for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, in the context of the accountability cluster of work and possible further action governments and international institutions might take in the areas of beneficial ownership, uh, tax, corruption, money laundering, uh, global financial integrity suggests that the panel promote the concept of trade integrity. Uh, defined as international trade transactions which are legal, properly priced, and transparent. Given that developing countries lose billions of dollars a year in tax due to trade misinvoicing, corruption, and criminal activity, what is needed is focus on, the, on ensuring the integrity of global trade, which will help governments collect the proper value 
from that trade and will enable them to mobilize funds to reach the SDGs and respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. To work towards trade integrity, the FACTI panel should encourage multilateral institutions and governments to first put special focus on international trade and specifically the beneficial ownership of freight forwarders, shippers, and other firms involved in the business of moving cargo. Two, undertake high level discussions regarding the feasibility of having all governments post all of their trade transactions online. This transparency will enable civil society, academics, researchers, and journalists to determine whether the developing country governments are capturing the maximum revenue from those trade transactions. Three, investigate the feasibility of using distributed ledger technology in international trade transactions to address the information asymmetry, which facilitates trade misinvoicing. Four, promote public private cooperation to develop information sharing strategies which will curtail trade-based money laundering. And last, seek efforts to improve transparency and accountability in free trade zones, which are infamous for their opacity. By taking these steps, we believe trade integrity will be realized and developing countries will reap the benefits of their trade transactions. GFI looks forward to an opportunity to support your efforts in this regard. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your contribution, Mr. Cardamon. Uh, next uh, speaker, uh, Peter. Yes, we have uh, Ms. Ikal Anjali. Um, I'm not sure her video will work, so I hope it will. Um, but I, I think we can hear her if she can speak, if she unmutes okay. herself. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chair. Um, and sorry, yes, I'm in a pretty rural place with very little electricity, so the power is a little bit down. Um, so I, I, I work with Friends of Electricana, but I'm a member of Femnet. Um, and, and one of the things we would like to, as, as Indigenous women um, is, is really around the transparency issue. As a lot has been talk, talked about in illicit financial flows, but one of the key things that we continue to see is that the transparency or the value of natural resources, um, which are really critical for the growth of the continent, uh, as well as the growth of women, is, is not spoken about. So everybody looks at illicit financial flows as what leaves, but then the value of resources is already skewed um, against the continent um, and especially against indigenous peoples. So as the panel uh, con um, continues with its work, we'd be very keen to see deepening work around the value of resources. Um, the second thing is also we are seeing uh, a change in the conversation around illicit financial flows because issues like um, climate, the climate carbon credits are not brought to the fore. And, and we are seeing again areas where indigenous communities leave is where a lot is being lost through carbon credits where states are not uh, part of the conversation uh, when this uh, this formula of, of uh, carbon credits is discussed as well as the indigenous people themselves um, on resources that leave their lands. Um, so I will leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Ikal. Um, and we have our last speaker. So uh, unfortunately, Clark had to leave and we okay. have Mar Marvi Mizolas. OK, so you, over to you, Mr. Mizolas. Mm. Marvi, you're still on mute. You have to unmute yourself. Thank you. There, great. Co-chair, uh, colleagues, my name is Sister Marvi Misolas, speaking on behalf of the Marino Sisters of St. Dominic, a global faith-based NGO accredited to ECOSOC, and also speaking on behalf of the NGO Committee on Financing for Development. Our organizations welcome and congratulate the panel. We are grateful to participate in this virtual global town hall with civil society. I thank the NGOs that have already contributed and the panel clarifications. SDG implementation phases an annual 2.5 trillion financing gap. Illicit financial flows account for 10% of the world GDP held in offshore assets, corruption, money laundering, 
tax evasion and other forms of financial crimes. Now, we are bracing the socioeconomic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. IMF projected negative 3% economic growth in the world economy. This crisis could already send vulnerable countries to further debt distress. Countries unable to fully finance its delivery of SDG targets, good, good health and well-being for all, and lacking universal health care are lagging in the fight with COVID-19. We urge the panel to keep in mind the suffering of so many people around the world while public resources that should have been invested to make lives better are being taken away from them. The NGO committee reiterates the concern shared in our intervention at the launch of the FACTI panel for a re-evaluation of the current economic and development models which perpetuate the unethical growth inequalities and corruptions while designing mechanisms to address illicit financial flows. In addition, as government grapple with addressing the unprecedented consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic, we urge the panel to expand its work and also to propose measures to curb bribes, kickbacks, and contract malfeasance that could derail outlays for procured resources and services and foreign assistance from reaching community-based organization micro and small medium enterprises which are crucial to the economic survival of women and marginalized communities. Co-chair, Merino Sisters of St. Dominic and the NGO Committee on Financing for Development would like to recommend the following actions. Set up capacity building and training mechanisms on anti-corruption at all levels. Civil society can be tapped to help in implementing this action. Number two, digitization or digitalization of enforcement mechanism and audit on the flow of assets from one country to another can strengthen transparency. Third, strengthen the role of civil society by engaging them at all levels related to financial transparency, accountability, and integrity. Their voices representing the people provide strong input in the review and evaluation of existing and new mechanism to eradicate illicit financial flows and corruption. Fourth, for panel members working on the accountability, public reporting, and anti-corruption measure clusters, we would like to see corporations and governments to report, one, on the sources of funds received, second, who is producing or doing the actual labor? Third, how does the money make its way to those who are most left behind? Such data would allow the target where change is most needed. As NGOs, we are extremely concerned that the world's 35 biggest banks have contributed 2.7 trillion to the coal, oil, and gas industry, which is in con contrary to the objective of Paris Agreement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Misolas. So we, we have come to the end of the list of speakers. Uh, maybe for three minutes, we could ask if any panel member would like to, to intervene on the issues that were raised. Dr. Mackey, if I may break in briefly, just also to yes. note that we had a number of questions submitted in writing um, in the Q&A okay. uh, about okay. the incorporation of human rights into the Perfect. panel's work, about okay. um, the potential of an international anti-corruption court, um, mm -hmm. as well as um, questions about uh, global asset registers and a number of other topics. Um, so panel mm -hmm. members may wish to address any of those as well. Okay. From your dashboard, do you see anyone wanting to speak? I do not, and I think all the panel okay. members have spoken already. Okay. So can I, can I intervene? Well. Okay. Oh, Mr. Kadar. Okay. Okay, okay no, Mr. No, Kadar. I just wanted to raise it again. I mean.
it's just uh, i'm just being you know provocative in a sense i keep asking myself this question um debt at the moment external debt of developing countries is eight trillion dollars i'm not referring to write-offs i'm saying can we incentivize it because getting anywhere in illicit financial flows in the short time frame that we all have i think is asking too much i'm not saying the work shouldn't be done it should be very much on the agenda it should be placed for other people to consider but given the time frame and we are referring to 2030 that's literally you know just down the road literally around the corner so in a sense uh I'm not trying to say that this work shouldn't be done, but really it diverts our attention from wanting to achieve uh, where you are incentivizing both parties, where you are also insisting that any cancellations will actually be reflected in these uh, spending uh, priorities. And then back to the asset registers, we are so bad. You know the institutional structures in each country. are such that even if we wanted to and we all know institution change is very very slow it's not something that you can literally change overnight changing institutions where in individuals human beings are involved uh, processes are involved is a painfully slow process and so if, without taking away the importance of these factors i'm only referring to really the very ambitious time frame to achieve the objectives of the sdgs so i'll just stop here but i can go on about the global asset registry i mean i i saw nissan referring uh, to uh, something that was said by the by mr piketty i've read that i mean theoretically it sounds very nice um, i can give you a long lecture on uh, global asset registry is what they look like at the end of the day it's both technical as well as the political feasibility as someone kept reminding us i'll stop here okay uh, f- thank you thank you mr kada so we we have come to the end of this uh, discussion uh, i would like to thank you all for the extremely valuable inputs um, which will inform the panel's uh, analysis as we advance our work and by building on your support and active engagement uh, i am convinced that we will be able to present innovative and forward looking solutions as we have been asked uh, to do so by february 2021 uh, within the capacities that we have and with the support of a, of a, of a secretariat uh many issues were raised uh, i'll just flag a certain number of them uh my synthesis is far from being complete uh, it is as a matter of fact very much incomplete but i i heard uh, uh, the well you want us to hear uh, civil society leaders um uh, your strong support for the establishment of an international forum for global governance of tax systems that's one of the things i heard uh, we uh, i also heard uh, the uh, encouragement to have a more holistic approach uh, not just uh, issues of transparency but overall reform of a global system i heard this uh, i also heard uh, how to balance the technical challenges versus the political ta- challenges and uh, i heard the, f- the necessity to focus on the most vulnerable and to take into account structural inequalities uh, human rights uh, uh, the gender equality and, and finally what we the outcomes of our processes should build that's what i heard should build uh, and not uh, contradict uh past work and processes so uh we will prepare a meeting summary and we will publish it on the facti website in in due course so i strongly invite uh, all of you to engage in the panel's future activities we sincerely believe uh, that your active participation will help us 
uh, present proposals that uh, would enable the global economy can to work for everyone and, and everywhere. So I wish you and your loved ones continued health and success to all efforts to control the spread of COVID-19 and address the economic consequences of a pandemic. And I uh, sincerely think, thank all the esteemed uh, uh, colleagues of the panel who were present. And I thank uh, the Secretariat for its uh, professional, strong, diligent uh, uh, support. Mm -hmm. I, I echo those sentiments. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kader. Uh, Peter, can we close the session now? Yes. Thank you. Or do thank you, you have any much. any issue to raise? No. Uh, no. We will follow up with everybody who participated. Thank you, everybody, um, for your participation. Okay. Thank you. Thank. Thanks to all. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you very much.